Well, as one exorcism ends, a darker and more sinister one returns. Hey guys, Cameron for The Exorcist, Season 1, Episode 8, The Grief Bearers, and holy shit one episode this was. I mean, this episode really looked like it was going to be crazy from the way Episode 7 ended, but I did not anticipate to be as crazy as it was. Uh, guys, a lot of people thought this episode was going to be the season finale, by the way things are, but this definitely, by the way it ended, this is definitely not the season finale. I mean, we may be done, but the story is definitely not done, and I can't wait to see the way that, uh... <coughs> These final two episodes are going to play out, but we'll get into that. Let's just get into this episode because this was by far the best episode of the season. I really thought that everything paid off really well, and uh, let's just get right into it because a lot actually ends in this episode, but a lot begins as well, and we'll get right into it. So we start off and we see Angela. Now, she is obviously righteously, rightfully very angry. I mean, the fact that, you know... Uh, Marcus kept this from her so that she wasn't told that Casey had been found because they were told they didn't see Casey. And, uh, Henry, Cat, and Chris barge in. The demon says, Mother McNeil, someone got old, and they can't believe Casey's condition as her skin has blackened. Her eyes are a horrifying brownish red. I mean, again, she's on the verge of death. Like, it's really bad at this point. And Kat is tricked into believing that she's talking to her sister. And then the demon tells her she's a terrible driver and makes her remember, um... The car crash and everything, you know, how Casey ended up getting possessed, which we remember that whole reveal, you know, with Kat making out with that girl, trying to experiment, and they try to convince Kat to walk away, and finally Henry is able to do it, so the demon turns his attention to Casey's father, you know, that being Henry, of course, and the demon tells Henry he it was responsible for making the scaffolding fall, causing his injury. Now, that was crazy to hear, but we find in this episode the demon is a lot more responsible than we thought, and for its next act, it tosses Kat and Henry into the wall, Angie yells at the demon to get the hell out of her daughter so the demon taunts Angela with Casey's current location she's in and we find out that she's in hell nailed to the floor in a room without windows she'll be alone forever but she'll know her mother put her there and uh it's just such a crazy scene the way that it was done uh everything about that scene I think perfectly sets up how crazy this episode is going to be we're not playing around anymore you know the demon is fully taking control of Casey and uh she really didn't seem to have any sort of control over it and just everything about that first scene uh, the way that we found out that, you know, the demon's responsible for Henry's scaffold, you know, Henry's injury that he's been going through all season, or, you know, what happened to Cad and things like that, the way the demon knows all this stuff, I think really just shows, um, you know, I think really just gets us to want, makes us go back to like certain scenes in the show and shows how well they have been setting this up. It really just feel like it's the final act. It's not the final act, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But I really thought this was a great way to start things off. I really did like that. And I think it perfectly sets up how crazy this episode is going to be. So the family is sent from the room as Father Tomas and Marcus continue the exorcism, and Henry's obviously very upset that they're not allowed to stay and observe because he wants to be there, and I like the way that Chris was able to relate to this. You know, Chris tells Henry listening to it happen from another room is the hardest part. She had to go through the same thing as you remember in the movie, and it was like the hardest thing she's ever had to experience. And Angela warns Henry and Kat to go home and pack, telling them she'll stay and see it through, and then, you know, she needs to be the one to stay there because she's gone through this before, and, uh, you know, she should be able to stay there and once it's over they won't be able to stay home because of all the police and media attention they're gonna have to leave because again they don't want to be part of this they don't want any part of the news or anything like that and they don't want the same thing that happened to Regan to happen with them so they need to be able to flee as soon as Casey's back and Chris, Kat, and Henry have to walk through a wall of photographers and reporters to get to the car. Mother Burnett steps outside to tell her reporters to leave because they're trespassing, but the police aren't really going to help. And, I mean, they do bring up a good point, that she wants to clear the area because the reporters are on the sidewalk, and there's really not much they can do about that. I mean, they're not really trespassing, they're just on the sidewalk. And the detective wants to come inside and see if Casey's in there. The mother won't allow it without a warrant, and Mother Burnett is just a badass in her own right. I really do love the direction that uh, she's been going, but the tour guide's experts on weird happenings around Chicago help bandage Father Bennett and make an anonymous call to police reporting a dozen human remains in the boiler room of uh, Tattersall landscaping. So right off the bat, you see they're definitely not going to get away with this, that this is in fact something that he is going to report. And I like the way that he was pretty able to expose them here because I was worried that he wasn't going to be able to, but it seems that the tour guides do have his back and I like seeing that. 
So Mark is in Father Tomas continuing the exorcism with Mother Bernadette's help, and Father Tomas wants to bring in Angela to try and reach Casey because she'll know how to get to her, but Marcus won't allow it. A fist, a full-on fist fight then breaks out between the two men. I feel like we've been building up to this fist fight. Like, these two fighting is definitely something that we've been building up to. We've seen how different, how uh, Tomas approaches things, different from how Marcus approaches things, and these two finally fight over it. The demon smiles, and Marcus notices the smile and tells Father Tomas that the demon's warming its way into their brains, and it growls, snarls, laughs at them. It basically wants them to fight, I guess as a distraction, so that way the demon can take more control of Casey, clearly. I think that's, you know, that's really what's going on there, but outside the room, Angela announces to Father Tomas and Marcus that she's ready. Marcus warns her again about what's in store, but Angela says she knows the demon better than anyone, so there's really nothing that's going to startle her that much. Like, she's seen the way this demon is, she knows the way the demon acts, nothing really is going to surprise her, and and uh, Marcus makes her promise to run if she feels the slightest twinge. And when they re-enter the room, items fall from the wall. And Casey, of course, says, hello, mommy. She wants to know why her mom gave up on her. And Angela obviously knows that this isn't her daughter. Isn't her daughter. And uh, Marcus tells Angela to keep it talking. And uh, I really did love the way this was done. And thus, we get to what is one of the creepiest things the show has done so far. So, Angela tries to get through to Casey by talking about what happened to her in her childhood, just trying to get her of memories, like how she fell uh, and broke her ankle and she just kept walking, and the demon says disgusting things about how she stretched Regan out as a kid. She even talks about Angela's abortion before she had Casey and Kat, so it really does show that this demon has been near Regan pretty much all her life. Like, even though Regan tried to run away, the demon always has found a way to get back to Regan, and that is a big part of this episode, the way, you know, whole idea of Angela can't run away forever, and Angela continues on, she tells her daughter she's strong, and Father Tomas and Marcus are staying with the exorcism script together, they all say, I forgive you, fallen angel, and, uh, very well done scene, I really did like the way it was done, but a news report then comes on announcing corpses were discovered at Tattersall, and Father Bish Father uh, B Father Bennett tells one of the higher ups in the Papal, in the Papal entourage that Tattersall is connected to the group funding the Pope's visits. So obviously, there's something going on that we know this is a corrupt group, and we know that the Pope is pretty much the center of it all. So Cat, Henry, and Chris pack as quickly as possible. Henry says they're going to move to Canada, and Cat wonders if people will just forget about Casey killing two people, and. Um, you know, because it's, she just killed two people, it's not, it's a big deal, but it's just two people, but Chris offers her house, but Henry thinks that they'll find her there, and that it's not really going to work out, so Kat declares she's not going back to school, and won't be convinced otherwise, so they're playing and getting the hell out of there, obviously, because it's just not safe, and, you know, no matter where they go, there's going to be all sorts of media coverage, and stuff that they really just don't want to be a part of, but, Marcus, Father Tomas, and Mother Bernadette circle Casey, continuing the exorcism. Angela then stares at Casey, making eye contact with the demon. She reads out loud from the Bible. Angela hears the demon's voice in her head. The demon wants to play a game just with her. And then we get what is probably the best scene of the show so far. I loved everything about where we end up because we end up back. Angela's transport back to when Regan was playing with the Ouija board in the basement. How this whole madness got started. And... The way they recreated this, I don't know if it was exactly shot for shot, but it was pretty damn close. Like, the way this was done, I know it wasn't the same actor, and I know it's obviously hard to, you know, get the same stuff, but they did a pretty good job at recreating the scene from the original film that we all remember, and... Angela sits at the table next to her younger self. Regan talks to the demon through the Ouija board. It spells out Captain Howdy, and Regan asks if her mom will get married again, and we now see the demon with the red bird on his shoulder, and he talks directly to Angela, and uh, for the first time, we see, you know, Pazuzu, or Captain Howdy, in human form, and that's something that we never got to see in the movie. That's something that the show has done very well, and... She remembers that he was actually the photographer of the zoo when she was sick. So it's not just the Ouija board that she has Captain Howdy. She's a Captain Howdy all her life. And asks why he's making her watch this. He tells her it's a stroll down memory lane. He leans over the young Regan who looks to be in a trance. And she's drooling. And this scene goes on for quite some time. But 
He asked Angela if she remembers how she felt when she was that young, and in response, she asked why he chose her, because, you know, what was so special about her? What was the whole reason they chose her over everyone? And he says that she was chosen because she was under his foot, and she's not special, and neither was Christ, according to the demon, and Angela tells the demon to leave her family alone, because, but he claims he's doing this because she doesn't just get to walk away, that this in, this in fact is her revenge for walking away, and he licks her face, tells her he misses her taste, and Chris, uh, Chris uh, back then, young Chris, comes down the stairs, asks Regan where she got the Ouija board, then tells Regan she's going to be a director, and this is basically the scene where we found that out. They happily walk up the stairs together, and I think it's just a great culmination of showing how far Angela's come, showing, uh, you know, how this all happened to Angela, and basically just showing, you know, what, and especially when we get to the end of the episode, I think has a whole new meaning that we really weren't thinking of, and I'm going to talk about that once we get to the end. But Father Tomas and Marcus continue their work. Casey's body slams up and down repeatedly. They continue praying over her. They give Casey her last rites, and the demon tells Angela that the show is over. She stops the demon from twisting Casey's head around, and Marcus and Father Tomas recite the last rites. Again, you know, you can see the demon is torturing her. But Marcus, Father Tomas, and Mother Bernard are all sent flying across the room. Casey's body breaks through of its restraints, flies upward off the table, flailing around controllably, and finally she slams back to the table, Casey says, Mom, and for the first time, Casey is finally back to her regular self. So, yeah, she's broken free of the possession in this episode, which I was very surprised about. It's only episode 8, but it makes that much more sense when we get to the ending, but... Angela runs to her daughter, she hugs her, Marcus and Father Tomas look exhausted, but pleased, because finally, after all the work they've done, it did in fact pay off, they were in fact able to save her, and it's just very, very rewarding, you know, we've spent this entire show trying to save Casey, and they did in fact save her, and just seeing the look on their faces, I love the way that was all done, um, you know, you, they really did feel satisfied from it, and I was very happy to see that things worked out well for them, and things did in fact work in their favor, which... I didn't really think it was going to. I really expected this to, you know, for them not to be able to save her or something else to happen. But that's not even the end of it. There definitely is more, but... An ambulance arrives to take Casey to the hospital as Father Tomas and Angela carry her out through the reporters. And after the ambulance pulls away, the reporters are anxious to speak with Mother Bernadette, but she simply shakes her head, obviously, again, wanting nothing to do with them. So police break in the building where the person behind the plot to kill the pulp is, is uh, supposedly holed up. They find him, but he kills himself rather than be taken in. So, again, we're thinking that, okay, this is over, but weapons and plans are scattered throughout his room, so clearly they know that he was up to something, that there obviously was a reason why he offed himself. We'll get back into that, but... The family gathers around Casey's bed at the hospital. The police tell Henry they need to speak with her as soon as she's awake, and Henry says the police will have to go through their lawyer before speaking with Casey, and Kat wants to know if Casey will be okay. Henry wants Kat to consider moving to her grandmother's house, and they both think it's weird that Angela's mom is a movie star, and maybe Chris has connections that can in fact help Kat, that maybe they'll, she'll be able to get them somewhere, um, you know, find somewhere else to get them, because you know, they just want to get out of there. Again, they don't want any part of this media coverage, they just want to be a normal family. Family. They haven't been able to be in a while, and they're getting they're excited to be that normal family again. I honestly did feel happy for them because this is all they've wanted throughout the entire season. They've been wanting to be, feel like a normal family. They've wanted to see him out of their daughter, and they've gotten you know he's gotten every Henry and Angela have gotten everything that they've wanted. Um, but at the same time, you know they haven't really gotten everything. We'll get into that, but I really did like the way that scene was done. Um, and I did like the way that again that seems like things are starting to wrap up here, and I like that Casey is still in a transfer the scene. That definitely does go with the end of the episode. So Marcus and Father Tomas are listening to music at a bar, they're relaxing, and it's cool to see them actually be chill for once, like just lay back, chill, and actually not be stressed out and freaking out over this demon. Tomas even tells a joke that they're back to being friends, and Father Tomas wants to know if it's really over. Marcus tells him he could be an exorcist if he wants to, joking that he would get to see the world. They make a toast to Casey, and to standing in the doorway and pushing back the night. Tomas checks his watch and says he has to go, but Marcus wants him to stay and close the bar down with him, but Tomas can't and says goodbye. Leaving as Marcus makes eyes contact with a handsome man across the bar, he doesn't get to act on the flirtation as a breaking news report reveals a police discovered a plot to assassinate the Pope. So we don't know uh, what's going to happen there, but definitely uh, we know that the police did in fact discover a plot to assassinate the Pope, so we don't really know what's going on with that. But the Papal entourage travel by car. 
Father Ben says that even now that there are still people faithful to the church in the city, despite what's going on, he asks the names of the faithful, suspicious of the question, and before he can answer, they place a plastic bag over his head and suffocate him. So, what's going to happen here? We clearly know that something else is up here and that this definitely isn't over, but we then see Jessica. She meets Father Tomas, and probably the most um, predictable thing in this episode happens where you knew this was going to happen eventually. She's at the church, but in fact, she's not alone, and her husband Jim is with her. He knows the two are sleeping together, and they have to put an end to their affair, and he wants to know how many times that they slept together. Jim tells Father Tomas he's hiding behind the white collar. Tomas removes the collar and wants to know if Jim wants to hit him. Like, he's ready to just be beaten for what he did, but he doesn't. He does probably something much worse than that. He says he'll call Tom Tomas' superior to tell him the priest committed adultery, and he's gonna be exposed for this. So, I like that there is, in fact, consequences for what Tomas did, because I've said it before, what Tomas has done is unholy. It's something that you shouldn't do if you're a priest, and I like that Tomas is going to have to pay the consequences for it, and Jim leaves Jessica apologize, saying she'll take care of that, of this mess, and I don't really think that she's going to be able to. I mean, at the end of the day, despite the fact these two really do care about each other, uh, he, he still committed, you know, adultery, and he still did something that you should never do as a priest. You know, he, um, pledged allegiance to God, and he went against it, and in the end, he's going to be, you know, detained for it, you definitely do see, so he is, in fact, going to be, there definitely is going to be consequences that he will be held accountable for, and he very well should be, because of what he did, even though I may like Tomas and Jessica, I'm not at all condoning what they've done, you know, I don't think what they've done at all is right, and I think Tomas knows that, but at the same time, it's kind of hard for him not to give in to temptation, which is something that this show has shown that may, way too many characters very easily do. You know, Tomas has done it, uh, Marcus has done it, even I think Regan's done it. Really, everyone has really given in to temptation. I think that's definitely a big part of, you know, what this show is really all about. So the news reports additional information on the Pope's assassin. John Harplin and Marcus recognize him as a guy who lived under a tarp. How could he afford the supplies? He couldn't, and Marcus knows that this is definitely not over. Like, there's definitely something more going on. And then we get to the scene that I know you guys want me to talk about, because it feels like this has been a very long time coming. We're back at the Rand's house, and Angela and Chris are talking while Angela packs up. Angela thinks it's crazy to walk away from her life for the second time, because she already did this, and... Angela is being very aggressively mean to her mom. We don't really know what this is about, but she's being really rude to her, like she wants nothing to do with her, and it kind of just feels completely out of place, because these two, as we know, have made amends, and Angela says she will forget everything her mother ever said to her, then use the nickname that her mom called her as a child, and Chris can tell that something's wrong, but it's too late. Angela twists her mother's head backwards, lets her fall down the stairs, and literally kills her own mother right then and there, and we realize that the worst thing that could have possibly happened has in fact happened, and the demon has transferred itself way back inside Angela, and that is the way the episode ends. Incredible stuff overall. Well, let's just get this episode where I think we're going to go for the last two episodes, because honestly, I really don't know. So once again, this show has brought us another incredible twist. I knew this was going to happen eventually. I just had this feeling that it was only going to be a matter of time before the demon did transfer herself back into Angela. You know, we've had all this Regan backstory. We've seen Chris. I mean, it just seemed like it was going to happen. And it just seemed like it would make sense. And yeah, it has in fact happened. And now it makes sense. And the biggest thing I do want to say is that scene where the demon is with Angela and it's showing her her life as a child. To me, that wasn't the demon trying to get her to reminisce. That was the demon finding its way to transfer back into Angela, and I think that it was a slow process, but the demon did, in fact, get itself back in her. It's gotten out of Casey. I think the plan all along was, in fact, to lure Angela there so it could get into Angela, and I think that really is what the demon wanted. I always knew that Angela was very deeply connected to this. I never really thought this was actually going to happen. I was hoping it would happen, and it did, in fact, happen, and I have no idea where we're going to go here because, yeah, a little girl possessed is very scary to think about, but it's even scarier when that little girl is now gr a grown-up girl who is on the run, who is with her family, whose family has no idea what she's really been up to, and I have no idea where we're going from here. I'm definitely interested in seeing 
what's going to happen here. Is Angela going to be able to get rid of the demon again? We had all of that stuff in this episode of you can't run away forever. You can't run away. So can Angela run away from the demon this time? I don't really know, but we'll have to see. Uh, let's talk about the Pope because definitely there's something more going on with the Pope. Uh, there's obviously a reason, you know, what's going on. Uh, Father Bennett, as we know, was in fact kidnapped. He had a bag put over his head. He was suffocated. And I don't really know what's going to happen with that because that definitely is going to be very interesting. Uh, what exactly is going on with the Pope? Definitely there's some sort of connection going on there and I don't really know what that's all about, but that's going to be very interesting. And as far as Jessica and Tomasco, as much as I think they want to continue doing what they're doing, there's only so far they can go. Again, what Tomas did was wrong, and he kind of needs to own up for his sins. I mean, I'm, I gotta be on, the, you know, his. I, I would be on his side here, but at the same time, what he did was wrong, and I think he does need to own up for what he did. So I think it's definitely going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen with that because I don't really know what's going to happen there. But that definitely is going to be very interesting. And then as far as uh, Marcus and Father Tomasco, are they going to have to be the ones to extinguish the demon? I think that Marcus is probably not really going to want any part of this, but he knows that definitely something more is going on. So... Is he going to be able to lure Tomas there? I mean, especially after what's going on with Father Tomas. You know, he's facing his own problems now. So will he really be willing to save Angela? Is he really going to be willing to do that? Again, we know that this was something that Father Tomas did for fulfillment. We still don't really know if he did it for himself or if he did it for the family. And I think it's a question that he still needs to ask himself. So I'm very interested in seeing what's going to happen there. Chris is dead. I'm really not surprised. A lot of people said that they didn't really know what to do with her. I feel like she served a purpose on this show. You know, her and Angela made amends, and Angela, of course, got the demon back in her. So I feel like we got all we really need with Chris. We don't really need her. She was never main character to begin with, so I understand why that turned out the way it did. But knowing that this demon has been you know, with the family for so long, I think they very well set up that the demon was going to go back in Angelo. It was such a well done reveal. This show really knows how to do twists really well, and I really have no idea where we're going from, I have to say. I think these last two episodes are going to be nothing short of epic. I mean, we're getting Regan being possessed again. It, it, it essentially is a, uh, you know, a, a revival series. It's, it's, you know, it's like a reunion series with Regan being possessed again on TV. It's incredible to watch. I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen there. This is going to be insane, and where we are headed from here, I really have no idea. But that's it for this video. Also, uh, will where is where are they really headed next? Because now we know Angela's possessed. Where are Henry, Katz, and uh, um, Casey going to go? Because obviously it needs to get out of there, but we don't really know. Is Angela going to be able to cover up Chris's death? I don't really know. But that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode overall. Absolutely love this episode. Incredible stuff. This, to me, was the return for the show. I think the past few episodes have been good. They've been a bit slow, and this, by far, was the return. I loved everything about it, and I will see you guys in my next video, which will be for tonight's episode of The Walking Dead, which, once again, is 90 minutes. I don't know why. It just is, but I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.